through the registered report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Registrar of Deeds of Plymouth County. This show is about Plymouth County real estate. We're going to be talking about some of the numbers for March, the recording numbers at the Registry of Deeds. This show is being taped in April. I have a great guest in the second segment of the show, Tim White, the Assistant Registrar at the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds. And then we're going to be talking about some of the county and colony history. So let's go right to the numbers. The first image you're going to see is of deeds. There were 725 deeds recorded in March, more than the 555 in February, 10% less than last year. Uh, there were 805 deeds last March. And I will say that uh, the number of records recorded in 2021 were the highest number of documents recorded since 2005. That was fascinating to me because it was during prime COVID time, but I think a lot of people were refinancing and, and they were moving around with their property, trying to find places where they could work from home. So year to date, um, sales were up 7%. Uh, the next image is sales throughout Plymouth County. There are 27 communities in Plymouth County. From Abington to Whitman, there were sales everywhere. The town of Plymouth had the highest number of sales, with Brockton being second. Uh, but every community had its activity. We were a very diverse county uh, from you know, Brockton to Mattapoisett, from Hull to Plymouth. A lot of our communities are different from each other, and uh, the, the valuations re reflected in that. So number of mortgages recorded in March were 2,158, um, more than the 1,747 in February. However, 48% less than the 4,180 mortgages in March of 21. As I said, there's going to be a drop this year. Mortgages year to date are down 48%, and a lot of that reflects in higher interest rates and the drop off in refinance. We've always followed foreclosure issues, particularly since the crisis of 2008. There was a moratorium in place for foreclosures during COVID. It's only recently been released, so the number of foreclosure deeds and notices are very low. There are only eight foreclosure deeds in the entire entirety of Plymouth County in March, less than the nine in February, but 60% more than last year, again, because of the moratorium, and 22% higher year to date. The next one is a foreclosure notice. It's the first document we receive at the registry that shows someone's in trouble. If you're having difficulty paying your mortgage, reach out to someone, particularly a federal housing counselor, and talk about maybe getting a modification. Uh, but the sooner you get to that, if you're having trouble, the better. Uh, NeighborWorks of, of uh, South Shore is one of the agencies that you can take a look at and talk to them. There were only 39 foreclosure notices in March compared to 35 in February. Those numbers are creeping up, but they're significantly uh, less than they were years ago, although compared to the last year's COVID moratorium, they're 117% uh, higher. So you're going to see a list of foreclosures and orders of notice for every community in Plymouth County. And you can see there are still a lot of zeros there, a lot of zeros in foreclosure deeds and a lot of zeros still in foreclosure notices. But be, be vigilant about your property. If you're having trouble, uh, don't be shy to reach out and try to get some help. Um, I'm going to talk in the next segment about some of the fraudulent things we see coming through the registry. I will talk in more detail about our free fraud alert that we have, we offer at the registry. But always beware of scams on your property. There are companies that will try to get you to pay $57, $80, $90, dollars to get a copy of your deed. They'll send you that in the mail. Don't do it because you can get a copy of your deed for a dollar a page at one of our three offices in Plymouth, Brockton, or Rockland. 
And I have Tim White coming on, the Assistant Register of Deeds, in the second segment of the show. So we'll see you next segment. Welcome back to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. And I have a great guest in this segment of the show. The second segment of the show, we always do something educational in nature, surveyors, appraisers, many realtors. But today we have the Assistant Register of Plymouth County Registry of Deeds, Tim White. Welcome back, Tim. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. So this is my 138th show. <laughs> You've probably been on about 10 of them so far. <laughs> You're probably right. Never, never mind we have you come on whenever we do any major changes in the, the way, way the registry works. Right. But you're also my permanent, uh, inter intermittent pitch hitter when somebody bails out on me. Yep, absolutely. I appreciate that. We had, we had someone that had a personal matter come up that was scheduled to be in the show as a, a realtor. But I very much appreciate you coming in. So let's talk about some of our recent things at the registry. Um, recent, I, I still consider the fact that we have achieved having every single one of our uh, documents imaged and indexed back to the beginning of Plymouth County and actually for the deeds back to the original Plymouth Colony. Right. So so just to, so everybody understands what you mean when you say that. Well, first right. off, going all the way back means going back to 1685. Right, for the for, county. For the county, 400 years. And then the image, obviously, is the picture of the document itself. Mm -hmm. So that whether it's a deed or a mortgage, it's actually, we, you could look at it on the screen. Every page of the document. And then the key to what you've really done so, so well and gone back so far is the linking. And maybe you can tell us what that means. Yeah, so it's one thing um, in, in the days long ago, I won't say the olden days, but uh, years ago, many people realized they would have to go to the registry, and it was a book and paper operation. You'd have to go to the big index books, usually near the back of the wall, wherever you were, whichever other, wherever the registry was. You'd have to go into that index book and find what you were looking for. Then you'd have the reference for the index book, you'd be able to go find the book and page, which was on different shelves, and you could get all that information to find out the ownership, any liens on the property, and, and, and any uh, flaws in the title in the that you title. might be able to find. Yeah. Uh, currently, uh, with the way we've done it, beginning slowly at first to get an image of every document all the way back to the beginning of the county, which was 1685, and, all to, and to take those images and connect them with a link to the index information and have that all entered manually also. So that now when you put a name in, say Tim White, and narrow the date down, you'll not only find um, the deed, but you'll find all index information all, all the documents under that. Mortgages, mortgages municipal lien certificates, everything, tax. E even those that are discharged paid yep. off. Yep. So you can make sure you have a clean title and you can understand whether there are any outstanding issues. I had someone call me today uh, checking on a family member. Now they had deeded the property to, to different interests several times. The property had actually been in a, in a tax taking by the town and they had a couple different mortgages on it. You could actually tell by bringing up that name within the date range when it transferred to different ownerships, when the mortgages were recorded, whether or not the mortgages were discharged, right. meaning paid off and recorded, and there's evidence of that, when the tax title happened for not paying their taxes, they actually uh, redeemed that tax title and paid it off so it's a clear title, and um, you could see that one of the people that had been a joint tenant had died, and they had pretty much taken care of it, except they hadn't filed the death certificate. Right. So by looking at the title, all the information, all the images in the index information on one page, you can see the history of that property. It's fabulous. I mean, it's just technology, obviously, makes so much easier, and, right. and you know, Sadly, I'm old enough to remember those days sure. when you had to go into right. the registry and, and, and you know, go from book to book to book, from the index book to the 
to the uh, record books. And to be able to do this type of research from your office is uh, just a tremendous asset that we've provided at the registry to our, our county. Uh, so when I, when I first got elected, I remember there were lawyers that were all, actually also title examiners that would go into the registry. Be, you'd see them wandering around the, the stacks of books, trying to pull, pull out six books to make sure they had the right one, yep. try to put them on a table, get the index books, bring them over, try to narrow Match it up, up. And, and write a sheet. Uh, now, for the most part, all our title examiners do their title examinations from home. Right, or from their offices. Or, or from offices right. that they've rented yep. to, to keep it out of their home and yeah. uh, can do that work and be able to certify title to the attorney closing. The, a, lot, a lot of what happens is the attorneys will get the, the job to do the recording, take care of it. They hire a title examiner who does a title gives it back to the lawyer, the lawyer checks it, makes sure it's correct, and they rely on that in order to transfer a title and because they have to certify good to, title. To, the, to the buyer that title is, is good. Yep. And by having it that efficient, it, it is helpful to everybody. Oh, absolutely. Just, yeah. it's, it's changed the entire industry. Right. Um, and you talk about how so many of the, of the title examiners are now working from home you know, one of the other big shifts occurred when we got hit with COVID. Right. And, and we would have st still a, a good number of title examiners coming in, even though they had the ability to work from right. home. Um, but um, fortunately for them, when COVID hit and they couldn't work or didn't want to work in the registry, uh, we had provided them with right. the necessary tools to allow them to work remotely. And now, I'm not sure we're going to be going back. Well, when, when, when COVID was com coming around, not even, you know, to the levels that it got to, um, thankfully, we had finished the index link project, and we had actually completed the ability to record over the internet in Lear Court, which a lot of the registries are catching up with now, so that basically you could, have, even though we were banning them, from coming in at that time, they could still do all the work and real estate flowed. And I know I've mentioned on this show before that in 2021, during the height of COVID, was the highest number of documents recorded in, at the Plymouth Registry deeds since 2005. And that still is mind boggling to me that during all those COVID figure times, it. we go had that much it. activity. Yeah, go figure. And a lot it. of it were refinanced. Yeah, and, and I mean, well, that wasn't just the refinances, the number of plans that were getting recorded, right. so for developing property here in Plymouth County. Right. But, you know, we were just so, our timing couldn't have been better, right. John, when it came to, you know, you've been able to electronically record on the recorded side. We have two sides of, at the register, the recorded side and then the land court side, the registered land. And you'd been able to do that for many, many years. Yeah. But never had been able to electronically record on the on the registered land side until literally three months before COVID hit. Well, and, for, for wow, any, talk about timing. For anyone that has their property in registered land, which is land court, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a much uh, cumbersome project, really had a lot more rules, um, and the fact that we were able to do that was great. Yeah. I, I'm not sure we're ever going to go back to the old times before COVID. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's so many people that are comfortable doing their work remote, although you mentioned uh, there was a, a jump in the number of people coming in to do closings today, yeah. and maybe maybe it's more convenient for people to do that, um, but, but clearly people have been capable of doing all their work outside, but in many cases maybe it's just because people are coming from so many different directions there are times when they'd rather just meet at there. the registry. And, yeah. and a lot of the purchase and sales agreements um, specify in the, in the contract of the, of the purchase and sale agreement that it'll be at the registry of deeds. Right, and right. So, yep. you know, that, that is, has always been the... Uh, but the, the, numbers, the numbers tell it all. I mean, you know, pre-COVID, we had uh, about 
40% of our recorded land was being electronically recorded. Right. So that's still a pretty good chunk of, right. of, of recordings. But since COVID's hit, we're now up around almost double, yeah, 80%. Double, yeah, double that. Close yeah. to 80%. And so you're, I think you're right. I don't think it's ever going to go back. You know, there's going to be you know, enough tools in the toolbox that you can do it in a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. and, and there will be occasions when the best way for the particular um, sale is to have a closing at the registry. And, and we'll see more of that, I think, as, as we get further beyond the the depths of the COVID-19 pandemic. But, but another thing that only you and I would know best is part of our job at the registry is, is to record documents. Part of our job at the registry is to not allow things to go on record that shouldn't. And that is probably the hardest part to make people understand that what they're trying to record doesn't meet the standards right. of the registry of deeds. And we've had numerous instances where we've, people have gotten very angry that you just can't record something against somebody else's property without having a judicial order, without having a certain 183.5b affidavit, which is clarifying title, has to meet certain standards. Um, and I would say that, you know, the probably equal to the importance of recording the documents is making sure that people's title aren't cluttered by unnecessary claims that don't meet the legal standard of the law. Right. And you've been very involved <laughs> in things like the mechanics liens, yep. uh, contractors liens, and things like that. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, it's actually something that I uh, did from the other side right. prior to becoming the assistant register. I represented a number of contractors you know, who would do work uh, on a property, um, oftentimes on a residence. And if there was an issue that uh, they needed to get paid, there is a, a legal procedure that if they want to secure the payment, that they can follow. But it's one that, it, I, for lack of a better phrase, there's a lot of red tape that you need to make sure you cross your T's, you dot your I's, and that you get the right recordings down in the right timing mm -hmm. uh, with the right information. Right. Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a good tool because, you know, you do the work on a, on a house, you want to get paid for it there's a dispute, then it brings the dispute to a head and, and it gets resolved uh, through the court system. Yeah, so the recording process is almost always voluntary, meaning that when you're deeding out property, it is your choice to deed to sell your property. Right, um, or to mortgage it. Or, or, or if you're letting a mortgage company put a lien on your property yep. because you're getting money from them to pay for the property. It's your choice to, to do that. Right. And, and, and you, there's a grantor grantee system that we've talked about before. Grantor is when you, the person selling the property grantee is you're the person receiving it. And it's a reverse for a mortgage. Mm -hmm. you're, allow, you're, you're allowing the mortgage company to have interest in your property. But y you can't just arbitrarily put something on people's property without their involvement and their assent. Right. And that is what... Uh, a few cases that, that happens, and that is tax liens mm -hmm. and, and contractor liens. Yep, yep. Um, or, or, and there are other, yes. you know, you could have judgments. Other exemptions. Uh, yeah. You know, where you go through the court system, right. you get an attachment. And get they, a judge's and signature get this, or, right. or a certified copy of yep. the judgment. Yep. Yeah. So, so that is what a lot of people don't understand is how much our role is not only in uh, per, you know, preserving your rights by recording it, but in protecting your rights by not l allowing certain things to be recorded against your property. And, and, and it's a fine line, John, because we're not there to practice law. We're not the attorney representing right. the consumer coming in the door. Uh, we're, we're simply the um, oversight for the recording system to make sure we comply with Massachusetts statutes and case law and indexing standards and things of that nature. Um, and, and you have to be careful that we don't attempt to practice law. But on the other hand, we want our recording system to be as clean and, and uh, fair as, as it possibly can be. So one of the things that I always stress and always share information about is that we offer a free fraud alert. Yeah. And, and um, it is a good way to know if something's going on on your property 
that you didn't intend to be recorded or if it's a lien coming on, you want to know about it. So if you go to our website under resources, our website's PlymouthDeeds.org. If you go to our resource section and look at fraud alert, you can sign up for that fraud alert and put in your email. And if something gets recorded against your property, you'll get an email and you will know, hopefully, whether it's something you intended to be recorded or not. And if it isn't, it's something you can deal with instantaneously. Right. Yep. And we very much encourage people to take advantage of we that. We do. We do. So, so I think we're, you know, we really ran through this program pretty quickly. Didn't we? Huh? Anything else you, that has come up recently? I know um, we had this, we get people trying to take advantage of people's property all the time. Um, one of which is this new company out there. They call it County Deeds Records. And they have all the information on your property, but they're trying to take, have you purchase this warranty notice for theoretically all of the assets of your house. And it's no more than a scam. So please be aware um, that because your home, for most people, is the most valuable asset, people will try to find ways to take that from you. So be very cautious about not only what you sign and what you agree to, but what other people may be trying to, to get you to do. Right. And uh, with that, I thank you for coming on the show. Great to be here again. Great. All right. Great. That's it. Welcome back to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. I want to thank Tim White for the great job he did in talking about the accomplishments of the Registry of Deeds, particularly the uh, index information we have provided and connected to the deeds we call the linked uh, indexes. Um, we've also done a lot of things to get ready uh, to do things online. Thankfully, it was all completed before COVID hit, in particular, the ability to record over the internet for both recorded land and registered land, land court, and it's really made people's life a lot easier. Uh, in this segment of the show, we talk about the holidays for the month. April Fool's Day was the first, National Beer Day the seventh, Palm Sunday the 10th, National Grilled Cheese Day the 12th, Good Friday the 15th, Passover started on Friday the 15th, Easter the 17th, Tax Day the 19th, Earth Day the 22nd, and Arbor Day the 29th. There's a big push this year about trees uh, planting trees was always a big part of Arbor Day, and now it's a big push because they really believe planting trees, in many cases, including your backyard, is a great hedge against climate change. Taking the CO2 out of the air uh, is what trees do best. So we're going to talk about a couple of our uh, notable land records. Uh, clearly, many people are fans of the Masters Tournament. Uh, it was completed about a week ago now. Um, a lot of people heard uh, when they watched the Masters about Amen Corner. It is the 11th, 12th, and 13th hole at Augusta. And a lot of people don't know how that got its name. There was a very famous golf writer who grew up in Brockton. His name was Herbert Warren Wind. He wrote for Sports Illustrated in the New Yorker magazine. He was covering the Masters that year when Arnold Palmer made his way around the 11th, 12th, and 13th hole and won the Masters. And he did it so miraculously that Herbert Warren Wind named those holes Amen Corner. A lot of people think it's because you make the turn there and there are a lot of corners there. That is not the case. It was named after a very famous jazz song at the time uh, named Amen Corner. And it came from a jazz record shouting at Amen Corner. Mr. Wind was a big fan of jazz and that name has stuck and many times they'll mention him in the show. They have a picture of him in the clubhouse at the Masters. Um, 
when I started putting this show together for this month, it was going to be opening day for the Red Sox. Opening day this year started in Yankee Stadium. Clearly one of the most famous players of all time for the New York Yankees was a fellow by the name of Joe DiMaggio. He was a tremendous uh, baseball player, led the Yankees to many world championships. But a lot of people don't remember that he had a younger brother that actually played for the Red Sox, Dominic DiMaggio. He was a Red Sox center fielder. He's a member of the Red Sox Hall of Fame. He was named seven times to the American League All-Star team. His nickname was the Little Professor. So Joe and Dominic were both born in San Francisco to, the, to Giuseppe and Rosalie DiMaggio. Uh, they both had immigrated from Sicily. Uh, Joe's nickname was the Yankee Clipper. Dominic's nickname was the Little Professor. He was a great center fielder, a leadoff hitter, and led the league in many categories. Um, after his retirement from baseball, he became a successful businessman. And then Dominic and his wife, Emily, retired to live in the great Plymouth town of Marion, where he lived until the time of his death. The next notable land record of the county land records is also a well-known baseball player, this time a Red Sox player. Ted Williams, probably the best Red Sox player of all time. Ted Williams didn't live in Plymouth County, but he had a baseball camp in the town of Lakeville. Um, he's been called the greatest hitter who ever lived. He's the last person in the Major League Baseball to ever bat over 400 in a season. He was one the American League Most Valuable Player in the Triple Crown twice. And he achieved this despite having a break in his playing. He actually was a fighter pilot uh, in World War II. And then he again was a fighter pilot in the Korean War. And despite those interruptions of his time of playing baseball, he really was a masterful player. In 1959, Ted and his partner, Al Cassidy, bought land in Lakeville to build a baseball camp. Uh, he always did an annual fundraiser for the Jimmy Fund. And while he sp spent his time at the camp, he would always fish in the ponds of Plymouth County. Many people remember Ted Williams as a great sportsman and who loved to fish, both in salt water and fresh water. And the pond behind the Council on Aging for the town of Lakeville, uh, where, where the Ted Williams camp was, uh, was one of the places that he would fish on a regular basis. The next and final record is a colony record. Uh, the Plymouth uh, Registry of Deeds hosts on the second floor of its building the Plymouth Colony Records, a fascinating collection of land records as well as court records. In this particular month, we're showing a record from the Plymouth Colony Court, a court order that is enacted that in every town there shall be three to five selectmen chosen by the town committee out of the freemen for betting, better managing the respective townships. It is found in Book of Laws, Part 2, page 88, and that was done in 1658. So even today, throughout Plymouth County, there are town elections going on this month, and there are many town meetings ahead of us, and all of those go back to the original establishment of that practice, along with other practices laid out when the original Plymouth Colony was founded based on the arrival of the Mayflower in Plymouth. So I want to thank Mike Simmons here from Brockton Cable Access for helping me put this show together. Um, Brockton Cable Access has been a great help to me in sharing this information over many years now. And I want to thank Lorna Green Baker and Christine Richards from my office for also helping me put this show together. And thank you to the local providers that I send this to for sharing this with their viewers. Uh, 
For most people, their home is their most valuable record. The more you learn about it, the more cautious you are with how you deal with that, the better off you'll be. And we'll see you next month. So happy spring.